Welcome to A Cowboy Life, the podcast presented by Smoothie King, blending goodness to fuel your greatness. This week's story is hot off the presses about a man they called Captain Crash. And hot off the presses because Cliff Harris just became the 333rd player ever inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Cliff played 10 years for the Dallas Cowboys at safety. He was a starter from the first day he arrived in Dallas. Big deal, you might say. That happens all the time. Well, not in the 1970s it didn't, and not if you were undrafted from a school in the Arkadelphia Hills of Arkansas called Wachita Baptist University. No, sir. Here is what day one, play one, sounded like when Cliff Harris joined the huddle for the Dallas Cowboys in week number one. The very first game of the year, and Bob Lilly looked over into my face. I was the only rookie starter and said, rookie, we're going to the Super Bowl this year, and I don't want you to do anything to mess it up. Do you understand? And I said, yes, sir, Mr. Lilly. The 1970 Cowboys camp at Thousand Oaks, California, offered 120 other rookies for Cliff to compete with. Plus, 54 veterans already a part of the team weren't even here yet. But there was probably nothing as intimidating as Mr. Cowboy Bob Lilly pointing at you in the first huddle of the year and saying, hey, kid, don't F this up. But let's back up. I mentioned Cliff Harris was from the hills of Arkansas, born in Fayetteville, Arkansas, moved to Des Arc, Arkansas in high school, which he says was a great break for him. He was a really good high school football player that nobody knew and nobody was paying attention to, no matter how good he was in high school. You only got into Wachita because someone knew someone said you need to give this guy a scholarship, right? Is that well, true? Well, it's kind of true. <laughs> yes, yeah. it is true. And my father's roommate owned a sporting goods store at Southwest Sporting Goods. Red Nelson was my dad's roommate in college. And he said to Coach Benson, who was the head coach, he said, you need to give that uh, Buddy Harris's uh, boy a scholarship. And this is the story I tell. And he said, he said, okay. <laughs> Cliff's father, O.J. Buddy Harris, also played football at Wachita Baptist. If you're picturing Arkansas on a map, well, Arkadelphia is about 60 miles of beautiful hill country southwest of Little Rock. You thought you were going to play in the NFL. How come? Well, um, they'd have scouts that come by and time us. And, uh, and I'd run some good times. And I'd had big games as a safety and as a as a cornerback. Okay, reading between the lines here, Cliff thought he was going to play in the NFL because, well, just he was. Somehow. Some way. Maybe. I can tell you, you know, there is no way <laughs> that, no way I should have had a chance to even try out. I mean, I was just lucky to try out. I was lucky to have an opportunity to go to training camp and was lucky to make the Dallas Cowboys and I was in the right place at the right time. Right place, right time? Well, yes, because the Dallas Cowboys had a man who scouted athletes to play football named Gil Brandt. He is also now in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Gil would traverse the country to find gems for his beloved Dallas Cowboys and his coach Tom Landry. He would even go to the middle of Arkansas, to a school that certainly was not getting national press for its football team. And he did. And he found Cliff Harris, a player that he was so impressed with that he would later say, if Cliff had attended Texas A&M, we would have had to use a first round pick on him. But nobody else found Cliff. So he was a free agent. So the signing bonus from the Dallas Cowboys for Cliff was small. Do you remember how much the contract was for? I do, very well, but I'm not going to tell you. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you. So my contract, my first year, I uh, had a $500 bonus, and I made thirteen five the first year, fifteen and seventeen uh, five. So let's take that first number there, he said, $13,500 in his first year, and let's give it some context for 1970. If you were a trade worker that helped build buildings in New York City in 1970, then you made about $12,500 a year. A professor at a local university, such as Wachita Baptist, for example, made $13,000. But this was the NFL, professional football, and Cliff Harris signed to play for the Dallas Cowboys for $13,500. 
Yes, he did. As good as Gil Brandt was at finding great players, he and the man he worked for, Tex Schramm, were known for shaving every penny when it came to salaries for the players for the Dallas Cowboys, especially in the 1970s. I made the starting lineup my rookie year. I right. was the MVP of two of the first games, first five games. Well, then I was told I had to go to the Army for basic training. I went to basic training, but I came back on weekends. Hold it a minute. He went to basic training for the Army, but was back for games on weekends? If that sounds strange, it's because it was. Unbeknownst to Cliff Harris, the Dallas Cowboys had well-known and well-placed front office personnel making trips to the 4th Army headquarters in San Antonio to talk with the general in a steam bath about delaying Cliff's basic training until the offseason. The general then sent that Cowboy personnel member to Washington to meet with the Secretary of Defense. The Cowboys, you see, had clout. And all of these covert meetings, well, they worked, sort of. That's how one month into his duty with the Army Reserve, Cliff was getting weekends off to play football. He was a Dallas Cowboy, but he was missing practices during the week, and the team and the coaches needed a full-time free safety. Charlie Waters ended up with my spot. Uh, he started his rookie year. Then he had to leave after five games, which is terrible. And I was thinking, how hard was that to what? For him to come in on the weekend, I was playing his position for him. That is the great safety, Charlie Waters, and you'll hear more about and from him later in this story, I promise. But just so you'll know, Charlie was a converted wide receiver from the University of Clemson that the Cowboys turned into a defensive back that same year. He too was a rookie, just like Cliff, and he had been drafted in round number three. And at the beginning of the season, he was going to be a substitute until Cliff was pressed into his military obligation. That was at a turbulent time. You wanted to support the armed services in sure. the United States, so you had to do what you had to do. But? But you also wanted to play for the Dallas Cowboys. Yes, you did. Thus, the Cowboys attempted to keep their prize rookie free safety on the team right from the beginning. By the way, Cliff got his free safety spot back the following year after his obligation to Uncle Sam was fulfilled. And by the way, the Cowboys played in the Super Bowl in 1950, just like Bob Lilly said they would. They lost, but they were a team on the rise. And what a ride already. And you think about the opportunity that Gil Brandt going to Washita Baptist and finding me there and giving me that opportunity to try out as a free agent. There were 120 rookies trying 120 out 120 rookies, at your, rookies. Rook at your initial camp. If that seems like a lot, it is. For reference, there were 31 rookies at the training camp in 2021 in Oxnard, California. 31, not 120. So why so many, Cliff? Because there was an NFL strike, and we had six rookie games that year. Six rookie games. If that seems strange, well, it is. There are no such things as rookie games now, but the veterans were holding out for free agency, and there were 120 rookies at camp. I guess so. Why not play some rookie games? But six? That's a lot of hitting and wear and tear on one's body. Training camp so long, guys were quitting because they knew they wouldn't have a chance. 45 veterans from the year before hadn't even come in. And I made the starting lineup, the only rookie to make the starting lineup. How does that happen? I don't know. I mean, it was just a, a God thing. I think I was blessed. Take us through your mindset at camp with all of those players standing next to you. I didn't know what to expect when I went to Thousand Oaks. After I got there and I started seeing what my competition was, I said, you know, I can compete with these guys. Whoa, wait a minute. I can beat these guys instead of going into it with a negative idea of, oh, gosh, you know, these guys from Oklahoma and Clemson and Texas and Ohio State, I can't beat them. Well, all of a sudden I got out there, I said, yeah, I can beat them. And I can also knock out some of these receivers when they come across the middle. <laughs> so, Cliff Harris was maybe six feet tall, 180 pounds, not big, one of 120 rookies, and it takes him about three days at camp to realize that he can compete and play with anyone on that field. And you now hear his mentality. As long as I'm here, I might as well knock out a few guys when they come my way across the middle. Where did that toughness come from? It came from my dad. My dad was a fighter pilot in World War II, flew a P-38, 
and was shot down in the South China Sea and paddled to the only American occupied island uh, in a day and a half in the South China Sea. He had diabetes, he lost his vision, he was going to be a jet test pilot and because of diabetes they washed him out of the Air Force. He taught me mental toughness. O.J. Buddy Harris grew up in Arkansas and played football at Wachita Baptist University as well. Then he went to the Air Force to defend his country. Diabetes shortened his aspirations and his life. Cliff saw what toughness looked like. So Buddy taught you to be tough. What did Tom Landry see to have so much faith in you so early as a rookie? I'd had two games in a row that my rookie year that I was defensive player of the game, and I had a big game against the New York Giants, which was Coach Landry, where he played. And I think that it proved to him that me as a player could perform and perform well and make the plays that, that he was counting on me making. Okay, a couple of good games early on, but there had to have been more than that through the years that allowed you to lead Tom Landry's team from the safety position. <laughs> defensive back. He and I related to each other and I was I was one of his guys, you know. There were a few guys that were uh, Landry guys. You know, he never could get my name right. He'd call me Chris or Phil, uh, but never could he'd say, you know, hey Chris, yes sir. I knew he was talking to or Phil, yes sir. So Cliff or Chris or Phil, whatever it was, made an impression and led the doomsday defense from the free safety position, unheard of. And this Cowboy team was a force, and they once again went to the Super Bowl. This time they were in New Orleans against the Miami Dolphins. And some well-placed officials thought it was a no-brainer. The Dolphins were going to beat the Dallas Cowboys in the Super Bowl. Nixon, a matter of fact, said, and it really upset me, and I confronted him in the papers. President papers. Nixon. President Nixon said, Miami's going to beat uh, the Cowboys because of the inside routes uh, to Paul Warfield. I was offended by that because inside routes meant he was talking to me. And so, so I said, no, he is not. And we shut him down. Indeed, they shut them down. Cliff and the Cowboys won the 1971 Super Bowl, the first for the Dallas Cowboys. They won it by a 24 to three score over the Miami Dolphins. It was a complete domination from beginning to end. But why were you so confident your team would win, Cliff? We had computerized printouts that the Cowboy Organization and maybe Gil Brandt and others had because we analyzed film. We put the film on, on computer printouts and the computer printouts were broken down by position, by down and distance, and by uh, primary and secondary receivers. So we knew what to expect. The Cowboys organization, led by Gil Brandt and Tex Schramm, were way ahead of the NFL curve. They were the first team to use computers, and thus these printouts with valuable information was there for them to study. And it gave their teams a clear advantage week in and week out. And it showed in Super Bowl VI and for the next 20 years. We dominated the Miami Dolphins and beat them handily. The Dolphins had a total of 214 yards of offense and scored a measly three points in the year's final game. The Cowboys were finally Super Bowl champs, and they were here to stay. Before there was a draft, you could size up a Cowboy by three simple factors. The crease in his hat, the bend of his brim, and his unbending attitude. A man Stetson didn't just protect him from what life threw at him. It projected a rugged, unstoppable spirit. Stetson hats are still American-made with pride right here in Texas. They're still the unofficial crown of all self-respecting Cowboys. And Stetson is proud to be on the field with America's team. Find a retailer nearest you at Stetson.com slash Cowboys. The Cowboys way, where 16 Hall of Famers and five championships shows us what success looks like. Where turkey is always the second best part of Thanksgiving Day. Where we are all defined by one single thing the star, where we as fans know it's our job to keep the tradition going. Bank of America is proud to be the official bank of the Dallas Cowboys and to support the quest of living life the Cowboys way. Copyright 2020, Bank of America Corporation. Want to use what the pros use? How about the official men's skincare brand of the Dallas Cowboys? 
Jack Black. Right now, you can get the Jack Black Starter, a curated collection of Cowboys locker room favorites for just 10 bucks with free shipping. The starter includes four Jack Black skincare favorites plus a full-sized intense therapy lip balm. Go to getjackblack.com slash cowboys and use the code word TEAMJB. That's getjackblack.com slash cowboys. The Jack Black Starter, 10 bucks. Free shipping. Honey, big news. Gary, are you okay? Oh, I'm not Gary anymore. I'm Jackie Flash. What? See, I want the latest smartphone, but the best deals are only for new customers. So to get a new customer deal, I changed my name to Jackie Flash. Okay, but the best smartphone deals at AT AT&T are for everyone, new and existing customers. That's huge. Then guess who's getting a deal? Is it Jackie Flash? Jackie Flash. It's not complicated. At AT AT&T, our best smartphone deals are for everyone. Restrictions apply. Visit att.com for details. There were lots of notorious Cowboys games played during Cliff's 10-year run in the 70s. One of the most talked about was certainly a 1975 playoff game against the Minnesota Vikings. But I didn't know that Cliff was a star in this game, too? That was a good game for me. I'd had two interceptions, but I had another situation that caused a little trauma for the coaches. So I was returning punts back there, and there was a player, a Viking, that would run down on the when they were punting and get right up in the face of the punt returner and cause him to miss, miss the ball or do something with it. Well, I had a plan. I was going to, when he came down and got at my face, I was going to judge the ball and it was going to come down behind him and I was going to go into him. Well, it's going to be interference and we were going to get 15 quick yards. If a defender interferes with a punt returner's ability to catch the punt, it is a personal foul and the receiving team indeed gets 15 yards. Since Cliff was standing with his heels on about the 10-yard line, well, maybe 15 yards in front of his own end zone would help. Maybe this is a good idea. This was a plan you hadn't shared with anybody. No. You had conco- this was a Cliff Harris concoction. This was a Cliff Harris deal. It was one of my brilliant moves that I did. And? It worked just the way I planned. I was about on the you know 15-yard line, and he came down and got right in my face, and the ball was right there uh, behind him. So I stepped up to bump into him. Well, he dodged me. <laughs> And the ball hit right on, in front of me and careened to my, my right. And so what happened, there was a big scramble because the team thought that it hit me. It didn't hit me. We tried to recover it, and they fumbled it. And Minnesota got the ball back, and it was on the 5-yard line or 10-yard line or something. They scored on the next play. So the way I look at this is a new perspective of this is so they started out with a seven point lead on us and you know that seven point lead and they didn't turn it up to be a three point lead well if i hadn't done that play drew would have never had the hail mary and roger would never have had that play because we would have been ahead of that time so i take some credit for that that hail mary pass <laughs> And all these years, I thought the Hail Mary pass was just a Roger Staubach to Drew Pearson miracle. But instead, it was a Cliff Harris concoction. In Cliff Harris's 10 years with the Dallas Cowboys, there were so many huge games. Five Super Bowls, six Pro Bowls, and he was first team All-Pro four of those years. But 10 years of flying around an NFL gridiron, laying wood to anyone in his path, eventually would wear down his body. I'd had an injured neck and I was paralyzed several times on the field momentarily uh, and got up. And I had to kind of change my style my last year of playing and not playing so aggressively because I didn't want to be paralyzed. And all of us can certainly understand that. None of us wants to be paralyzed. So what finally pushed you to retire, Cliff? I'd been working the off-season energy business with uh, Max Williams U.S. companies, and he told me, he said, hey, Cliff, you've got to make a decision. Uh, you want to work in the energy business or play for the Cowboys? The energy business was paying big dividends already for Cliff and his partners, and then there was also that I don't want to be paralyzed thing. Cliff knew what the answer was, and he had lots left to do with his life. I called Coach Landry and said, I'm going to retire, and he said, Cliff, could you come over to my house and talk to me? And uh, I said, yes, sir, I've never been to your house. Where is it? And he told me where it was, right off Northwest Highway. 
across from Methodist Church. And I drove down there and rang his doorbell, and uh, Miss Landry opened the door and said, "Oh, Tommy's here waiting for you, Cliff." And I said, "Oh, good." So I was went down to his study, and uh, he said, "Cliff, I'm not trying to put any pressure on you, but I didn't think you were going to retire. I thought you had two or three more years." And I said, Coach, you know, I know you're not trying to put any pressure on me, but I've never been to your study before. <laughs> and uh, I was trying to be funny, but. Uh, that is funny. Uh, I think mission but, accomplished. Did he find that funny? He, no, no, he didn't. He didn't um, find that funny. Tom Landry was a faithful, hardworking man who was light years ahead of the other coaches in the NFL, but he was never known for his stand up comedic routines. And I've got a, an opportunity in the oil business, energy business, and. He said, all right. He said, oh, that's fine. Then you do that. He said, "If you'll just do one thing for me. And that is, if you will stay in shape during the season, and if Charlie's knee, see, Charlie had hurt his knee the year before, and he was out all that year. And he said, and he's coming back this year. If he can't come back, will you come back? And I said, yes, sir. I'll do that. I'll come back. So I stayed in shape. <laughs> Charlie Waters' knee healed up just fine, and he played that 1980 season for the Dallas Cowboys. So Cliff's playing days were over. In 1985, Cliff became eligible for enshrinement into the Hall of Fame, but he didn't get enough votes, and it stayed that way for quite a while. He came close a few times in the late 80s. He was voted on the All-Decade team of the 1970s at some point, but never reached the final group for Hall of Fame worthiness until 2004, his final year of eligibility as a player. This was big. Here's one of Cliff's sons, former Arkansas Razorback free safety Matt, and Cliff's awesome wife, Karen. Let's start with Matt. That day is a day I'll never forget. We were in uh, Cherokee, Texas, in South Texas, and I think he knew in his gut that this was like his first real shot at it, and it was 50-50. Yeah, we thought he was in. We even got a packet from the Hall of Fame that had our plane reservation information for the Super Bowl and... He'd been nominated several times, but never got that far. And so the fact that he made it to a finalist position, it was we were thinking that that was it. He was up with Rayfield Wright, Bob Hayes, and himself. We were just scared that all three weren't going to get in. Rayfield got in. Dad didn't. First thing he did, Brady, I mean, I think it was within 60 seconds. He took a minute to, like, be bummed, and he picked up his phone and he called Rayfield Wright and he congratulated him. He did stuff right. Rayfield, I was so proud of him and he was truly a Hall of Famer and I've said that all along about him and I was happy for him. He handled it with so much dignity and grace. We knew that was the last year for him to be a modern day finalist because after that year he fell into that senior category and good grief, it's just so hard to get in when you're when you're in that senior category. You live your life not in the past and the future, and I I said, well, you know, I still have a chance. Karen was right. From 2004, the next time Cliff made it as a finalist for enshrinement into the Pro Football Hall of Fame was 16 years later, 2020. How discouraging did it get in those last 16 years, Cliff? You know, I've never lost complete hope, but it, it does diminish somewhat in your mind as the years go by. 16 more years was a long time, and really it was 36 years since he became eligible back in 1985 for the Hall of Fame. That's a long time. But in 2020, the long-awaited news finally came. Cliff Harris got the call. He was finally going to be able to write H-O-F next to his name when he signed autographs. Karen. He finds out in January. We found out, we got the call, and it was just, it was just the most amazing day. When I heard that I was getting in from David Baker, they're just incredible. I'm, you know, just had an unbelievable moment of just re realizing the significance of all that. I can only imagine the rush that you must have felt. You had waited longer to get this call than you did to play your first game in the NFL, nearly another lifetime. 
Here again is his dear friend and great Dallas Cowboy Charlie Waters, who teamed with Cliff at the safety position to be a big part of the Doomsday defense. Cliff reminded us, Brady, that the game is a contact sport. One NFL coach said of Cliff Harris's style of play on the football field, he looks to me like a rolling ball of knives. Here's Charlie. Because of Cliff's style of play, Coach Landry designed a defense that was way ahead of the times, and he used Cliff as a weapon. Cliff Harris had come from a tiny school in the middle of our country, the middle of nowhere, and he was a nobody, a wannabe, in a cowboy helmet. Charlie. That's one thing that we shared, in that I was a long shot, he was on an uphill battle, and I was on an uphill battle. Cliff was a free safety, and I was a strong safety. Hi, I'm Clint Tillerson with United Ag and Turf. Before you can park yourself in front of the game, park yourself in a John Deere and power through your chores. Our Land Run package is a 1025R, 25 horsepower tractor with a loader, rotary cutter, and a box blade for $229 a month. And the price you see is the price you'll pay. No surprises. So don't miss another kickoff. Visit unitedagandturf.com. Offer ends February 1st, 2021. Restrictions apply. See dealer for details. Now let's get to work. Honey, big news. Gary, are you okay? Oh, I'm not Gary anymore. I'm Jackie Flash. What? See, I want the latest smartphone, but the best deals are only for new customers. So to get a new customer deal, I changed my name to Jackie Flash. Okay, but the best smartphone deals at AT AT&T are for everyone, new and existing customers. That's huge. Then guess who's getting a deal? Is it Jackie Flash? Jackie Flash. It's not complicated. At AT AT&T, our best smartphone deals are for everyone. Restrictions apply. Visit att.com for details. New Dr. Pepper Zero Sugar. You deserve it. I do deserve that. You deserve decadent flavor without sugar. And a day at the beach without sand getting everywhere. And a relaxing bath that your children don't interrupt. I deserve all that? It's really just a visual metaphor for Dr. Pepper Zero Sugar. Everything you want, nothing you don't. A visual metaphor on the radio. I do deserve that. Dr. Pepper Zero Sugar. The zero you deserve is finally here. Before there was a draft, you could size up a cowboy by three simple factors. The crease in his hat, the bend of his brim, and his unbending attitude. A man Stetson didn't just protect him from what life threw at him. It projected a rugged, unstoppable spirit. Stetson hats are still American-made with pride right here in Texas. They're still the unofficial crown of all self-respecting cowboys. And Stetson is proud to be on the field with America's team. Find a retailer nearest you at stetson.com slash cowboys. Cliff had an uphill battle because of where he came from and because of the fact that he was an undrafted free agent. Charlie was a third-round pick from a big school at Clemson, but he was a wide receiver in college. When Gil Brandt called him to say he was picking him in the third round, he said, can you run backwards? And Charlie said, yeah. So the Cowboys turned him into a safety. Why did two long shots become so good at playing football in the NFL for the Cowboys, Cliff? We had a real good understanding of the complete defense and how it worked and how we could work together. And we worked together as a tandem and we knew how to work the Landry system. We could just look at each other and we knew what the other one was thinking. Gil Brandt saw something in Cliff and Charlie when they were just kids, and boy was he right. Charlie understood covering wide receivers because he had been a wide receiver. Cliff knew how to hit like a hammer because his dad, O.J. Buddy Harris, taught him principles of leverage and how to use his body as a hammer. And they studied and worked together, and a bond was formed, and they became friends for life. Up next, well, Cliff has to write a Hall of Fame speech. Speeches, not Cliff Harris's strength. Here's his son, Matt. My dad, he wasn't meant for public speaking. I was a little jittery about, you know, getting up in front of 30,000 people and nationwide talking to, you know, doing a speech. I've seen Cliff give speeches to as few as 30 people, not 30,000, and it's not pretty. He cares way too much about every word and every person that he's talking to. He is a classic overanalyzer. He has all of his notes and Brady, it's like reading Braille. It was like, I could barely read what my dad would write. And then he'd have arrows. Six months leading up to it, 
you would think 50-50. He's going to bomb it or he's going to do great. It's a nervous energy on his part. It comes from because he's a math major. He's a stickler for detail all the time. And... Okay, so how did this speech ever round into shape? Here's his wife, Karen. He put so much thought into it, and he practiced on me quite a bit. And I was pretty nervous about it, Brady, because I just felt like he was... He would read the speech to me, and it would sound very flat. But I also knew he was trying to get so much verbiage in that he he needed to read it. And um, otherwise, he would be he would be lost in front of that many people, just trying to say it off the cuff. The Hall of Fame setup for the inductee speeches is pretty cool. There are three teleprompters in front of you, one right in the middle, and one on each side. If you dare look away at your audience on either side. But teleprompters are not easy. If you look away, the words have come and gone. It's a help, but it ain't easy. Anyway, when I heard his speech for the first time, there was one part in there that was especially amazing, and I knew he had reached a place of peace with his speech. We have a place in, um, in Arkansas on Lake Washita, and I mean, he loves to go up there and hike, and he always wants me to go with him, he says he does, but I really think he enjoys that alone time because it's really when his brain, his, his crazy, intelligent brain kicks in. He hikes the trail in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and he told me about this before we went to Canton. He was like, Matt, it wasn't part of my speech, but I think that's the way my life was, Matt. He's like, I just took care of every rock that was in front of me. I just made sure I didn't stumble on the rock on my next step. I looked down, I made sure my foot didn't slip. He's so poetic. How romantic is that story? Like, what a lover. So the speech had gotten written and Cliff was finally breathing normally. He was ready. What was the key, Cliff? My wife, Karen, is, has a calming effect on me and certainly and I have a lot of belief and love and trust in her. It did calm me down to something. She gave him a comfort level of confidence. And most of the time, that's what spouses do, if good ones do. And, and Rosie does it for me. And well, I tell you what, Karen has got a great personality for Cliff. He's done so much for me. Cliff does so many things for so many people. I know that has nothing to do with football or Hall of Fame, but he truly is a Hall of Fame person. He's our spiritual leader. He's our protector. He's our advisor. I mean, he's just, he's the whole deal. And uh, we would be lost without him. Got it. Love was the key, and isn't it always? Matt, was he ready? How do you feel? You know, are you nervous? Are you feeling good? And he looked at me and he's like, you know, I kind of over-dramatized things. I overdid it a little bit. I feel really good. With Karen's help and his divine epiphany on that path in Arkansas to cap off his speech, Cliff was now ready for his big day. The only problem was, it was a full year later than it was supposed to be because of COVID-19. And now in 2021, two groups were going into the Hall of Fame at the same time. The 2020 inductees, which Cliff was a part of, and the 2021 group. Did that suck? I was disappointed that we didn't go in that first year. But, you know, you can't take away that you've made it. As it turned out, going in at the same time and us and twice as many people it turned out great. That bronze bus, no matter what year you do, it's going to last longer than you anyway. Whether it was one year's worth of inductees, or in this case, two groups, it was a magic ceremony. And anyway, his teammate Drew Pearson, that great wide receiver, was in the second group. So Cliff got to be with his friend when he got in as well, and it meant a ton to him. Drew is an emotional guy, and, a, and his passion, and what made him a great player, and I'm so happy that he got in, and I'm probably happier for him than I am for me. Drew Pearson and Cliff Harris won a Super Bowl together, and we know that Cliff made the Hail Mary catch possible for Drew. At least we know it now. So cool. It's time for the speech. How nervous were you as you headed up on that stage? I had Charlie Waters up there with me. It was really good to kind of share that time with him, and he was my presenter, and, man, I couldn't have had a better better guy and a better friend to have him as uh, someone that I uh, that was a part of my deal because he was a part of my career and helped me so much. So a friendly face with Cliff up on the stage in Charlie Waters. He even helped Cliff take the cloth off to reveal his face on his bronze statue. That was a nice moment. And then it was time to hear from Charlie on his dear friend Cliff. 
It's an oxymoron to say that Cliff is just a football player. He's a lot more than that, and he shows it all on the field. He had a great passion for it, and it was contagious. Everybody on the team understood what Cliff stood for and how he played. It was a Gilbrandt genius that brought Cliff Harris to the Cowboys. He was from a small college, Washita Baptist College in Arkadelphia, Arkansas. And this guy's got a chance to make it in the NFL. And he makes it, and he makes it with an exclamation point. I have a son that was born on Cliff Harris's birthday. And my wife comes in and tells me, she said, you got the name him Cliff. And I went, the hell I do. <laughs> but I ended up naming him Cliff, and we're real proud of it. So I'm honored and privileged to present my great friend Cliff Harris for enshrinement into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Damn, that was pretty good. Way to go, Charlie. Now it's Cliff's turn, and he's ready. I'm pretty sure. Wow. What an incredible journey this has been for me, and, I, and what an honor it is to be here with all these legendary players and coaches and so many special friends. There are so many people in my life that I need to thank. First, my beautiful wife, Karen, who's here tonight, who made my life complete. I only wish she could have been joined by my wonderful, dedicated parents who spoke supported me so many years and when others counted me out. My dad taught me mental toughness and my mother instilled me with passion. I've also been blessed with many great coaches. I'd like to thank Coach Gene Stallings, who had the patience, which I tested many times, to bring out the best in me. And then, of course, Tom Landry, who created the great flex defense that fit my style of play perfectly. And I'd like to thank, more importantly, Gil Brandt, very importantly, Gil Brandt, who had the search long and hard to find me hidden in the Washita Hills. Thank you, Gil. I also like to had the great fortune to play with many legendary players, players who taught me the ins and outs of pro football and how to survive. Players like Leroy Jordan, Mel Renfro, Cornell Green, and Bob Lilly, and, and of course, my longtime fit friend and fellow safety, Charlie Waters. Charlie Waters. Without him, I wouldn't be here today. Thank you, Charlie. We were the doomsday defense. If I can make it, Anyone can achieve their goals. The key is to never quit, never give up, keep trying, keep learning, and keep growing. My roots are still in the Arkansas Hills. I was hiking there the other day, contemplating this speech, when I looked over to see a huge storm brewing over the tops of the hills. I still had a couple of miles to go on that rocky trail, but all I could think of that I, and more importantly, my cell phone, were about to get drenched. So I liked the challenge and I knew I was up to it. I knew better than look too far down the long path as it would be too, seem too imposing. Rather than that, I just put my head down, made sure that I made it past every rock without stumbling. I realized that was a metaphor for my life. I've never taken anything for granted. I've never looked too far down the road. I've stayed in the moment, focused on, focused on that rock right in front of me. I did trip on a rock or two that day, just as I have in my life, but I didn't get discouraged. I got right back up and pushed even harder. I took one step at a time, avoided one rock at a time, and before you know it, I'd achieved a goal. One last thing has been vitally important to me, and it is my faith in God. I've got good fortune in my life, but God has always been in control. God gives us the freedom to choose our challenges and how we'll face those challenges and opportunities in our lives. You really have to believe in yourself and trust that God will be with you. I like what Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him 
and he will make straight your path. So keep a steady pace. Remember that you are the only one who drives your train. If you trust in God and make the right choices, you will succeed. You'll make it to your own Hall of Fame, whatever that might be. Thank you. So, what did the family think? How'd they think you did? Here's Matt. You nailed it. Your speech was great. I was so proud of him when he actually got up and, and at the enshrinement and, and did that speech. I thought he knocked it out of the park. I was, I was just overjoyed that he did it. He handled it as well as he did. I completely agree. I was on the phone texting him right away as soon as he finished, especially about that rock story. One foot in front of the other, never looking too far down your path. It was awesome. When it was over, what were you thinking, Cliff? The Cowboys had such a great team during my, the era that I played. I think about those guys and I think about the great fortune of playing in 10 years and playing in five Super Bowls. I was the 333rd Hall of Famer, of which there's, you know, less than 350 in the whole Hall of Fame. And just so you'll understand, that number 333 is embroidered on the inside of his beautiful gold Hall of Fame jacket. Pretty damn cool. Thank you, Cliff Harris, for telling us about your cowboy life. <laughs>